Hope you're doing good. All right. Raise your hand if you have a pet. Okay. All right. I did not see it going down like this. Raise your hand if you have a cat. All right. You don't count. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Raise your hand if you're a dog lover. Are you the dog owners? Okay. All right. Okay. Good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to all pet owners, but I don't know if there's a cat park, but I do know there are such things as dog parks. Have you ever been to a dog park? Anybody? Yeah. These are fun, frolicky, happy places where dogs can frolic in the autumn mist and have a good time and can wander around and do what they do, sniff things, and, 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 it's, and it's supposed to be a really fun time, and they can run and be free and happy like this, and you just, you just love the energy and the joy and their, and their, their exuberance, right? Now, if you're really brave and you have a trained dog, some of you do not, you let go of the leash. I don't even know if that's legal. It may not be, but sometimes people let them go. I've seen them take them off like, Run free, Fido. Go. Have fun. You have to either be super brave or really, really, really think your dog is disciplined. You have to really trust that dog. In fact, when it's time to go, I've often wondered, what do you do? How do you get that dog back? Well, the trained ones, I'm told, have their dog so well disciplined that when they call their name, they stop and they look. Now think about this, even if there's 20 or 30 dogs <laughs> running around like that, having a great time, your dog hears your voice and stops. Even if there's other pets in the park with the same name, only yours turns and looks at you. Now why is that? Not only do they know their name, they know your voice. Y'all, there's so much deep gold right there. That is just like what we're looking at today. We will look this week and possibly into next week. The more you pay attention to Jesus' voice and to the scriptures, the more you are going to know his will. The more you will sense the Spirit's leading. When you come to that question, you need an answer to. When you're at that crossroads, you're at an impasse, I mean, you really just don't know whether to fork left or fork right or wind the watch or turn around and pick a bale of cotton. You don't know what to do. You're just confused and you are, Lord, are you silent? I really want to hear your voice. I really want to know. Well, here is the good news for you today, okay? Hear this loud and clear. God does not want to hide his will from you. He does not want to veil it. He's not some fickle genie in the sky who's like, I know everything about your life. I'm just not going to tell you. Thankfully, that's not him. In fact, God is more desirous of you finding his will and walking in it than you are yourself. Let that sink in. He wants you to know his will even more than you do. He really wants, you know that old cliche? It's so true. God does love you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And he's not trying to hide it. He wants you to know it. He wants you to walk in it to accomplish his will, his purpose. So my question for us as we start today, are you open to him speaking to you through the way he chooses? Are you? How open are we? Because I think if we're honest, we put God in a box. We say, God, I want you to speak to me only this way or only this way. This is the way I'm comfortable, God. I want to put you in a box, and I want you to talk to me in the way that only I know that I can, can't miss it and I recognize it. But do we miss his plan sometimes? Because that is exactly what we look at today. An unlikely messenger shows up to deliver a huge bombshell of a message. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers 22, pull that up. While you do, let me welcome those who are joining us online. Always love to have our online campus with us. Good to have you there. Numbers 22, and just kind of hold your place there. Let me set the context for what's about to happen here. Here we have Balaam. Balaam is a prophet, but he is not a prophet that you like, that you want to follow. This is not the godly prophets of old. This is not an Elijah-type prophet. This is a pagan prophet. He was known as a seer. He could look into the future. He would divine things. In fact, he was called a diviner, a glorified advanced fortune teller, if you will. The only problem was the methods he used were blasphemous. He was an animal divination expert. If you're not familiar with what animal divination is, let me just say it has to do with using sheep liver. Sheep liver. And we'll just leave it there, okay? That's what he used to consult the gods, little g, to determine the future. And he was for hire, and he was making a killing in this. People love to hire Balaam. He was well-known. He was famous. He was even respected. 
I don't know why, but he was respected by people. So Balaam saddles up his donkey, his favorite donkey, and he starts to head off the road. But God wants to send Balaam a message. So what he does is he sends an angel of the Lord to block the road in front of Balaam. And Balaam, as he's riding along, does not see this angel standing in the road with his sword drawn, but his donkey does. His donkey sees it and starts to freak out and is wondering, why is my master still whipping me and nudging me to go along when he clearly sees this huge, glorifying, terrifying, beautiful, yet frightening thing standing in front with a sword drawn? What is going, why is he still wanting me to go? Does he not see it? Obviously not. When I picture these guys, I can't help it. This, there's terrific irony here. Don't miss the fact that Balaam is known for being a well-known, respected, famous seer, and he's not seeing this angel. And the donkey, the lowest and dumbest of beasts, does see the angel. The seer doesn't see, but the lowly donkey does see. What terrific irony for what's about to happen. When I picture these two, the only picture that comes to mind to me is this. This is what I've, right? Anyone else, when you hear lowly donkey, you think, donkey, Shrek, I have a donkey, let's make waffles. And you think this is, this is the, the beautiful picture of it, but it gets even more wild. The donkey sees the angel and reacts smartly, the way we would. He backs up, and he gets a little terrified, and he's like, I, uh, do you see this? this is, if you've ever walked a pet and they see something that scares them, they start pulling on your leash. But Balaam says, keep going, keep going. I have a brilliant idea. I'm going to beat my donkey harder because that's what us guys do. When we don't see something, like, we force our way through it, and we do this a lot. Here's my brilliant idea. I'm going to beat the donkey, and I'm going to continue on. The angel sees this and does something wild. Backs further down the road between a narrower place, between two walls. So now the donkey has a really tough decision. Do I obey my master, who's now beating me for a second time to continue, or do I, do I stop? Do I go? What do I do? So he tries to be faithful, and the donkey skirts around the angel. I can see these bulging eyes just looking up, trying to get around. And then inadvertently, he crushes Balaam's foot against the rock wall. How do you think Balaam feels about that? Like a typical guy, he gets mad and madder. And mad. the more he thinks about it, he starts to beat the stressed out poor donkey. He says, I can't believe it. Why are you doing this? And you just know the donkey is looking up going, what is wrong with you? Do you not see this horrifying yet beautiful angel standing right in front? And he beats him even further to proceed. But this time, the angel moves even further down the road and stands in a place so narrow it is impossible for the donkey to get around. There is no sidestepping this time. The, the donkey walks up, and I love how the donkey reacts. The donkey does this. He just lays down. Says, I, you're beating me. There's an angel. I see a sword. I don't know how you're not. I'm, I'm out. And he gives up, and he just lays down. I will give you one guess of how Balaam reacts to that. Yes, he beats him again because he's mad. He's furious, and he starts to beat him, but something really bizarre happens here, something strange. Strange things begin to happen. In fact, I was going to call this message Stranger Things and do a whole series on this, but I haven't seen this series enough to know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, so maybe in October we'll come back to it. Just know that this is full of bizarre and strange things that there's so much hidden gold here. God does something totally shocking and unexpected for Balaam. The donkey turns to him and begins to speak. And he doesn't speak donkey. It's like, blah, 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 blah. He speaks Balaam's language. He looks at him and he says, check it out for yourself later in verse 28. He says, what have I done to you that you have beaten me these three times? Can you picture this? The donkey is saying what we're all thinking. What is wrong with you, master? You're beating me three times? Seriously? Can you not see this? Now, I don't know what's more surprising to me. The fact that a donkey literally begins to speak to Balaam or the fact that Balaam apparently isn't shocked at all by this. In fact, he talks back to the donkey as if this is normal. He's like, he, we would be like, whoa, I'm out. I'm getting off this donkey. He's already laying down. I'm running down the cavern. But he looks back and he responds arrogantly without missing a beat. Don't miss this. He says, if you do that again, you make me look stupid. You hurt me. You abused me. It's your fault. You pushed my foot up against... Can you imagine this? Whose fault is that? 
Is that the donkey's fault? He was the one that was beating him through this whole thing. He talks back to him. He says, you abused me. And then he goes on to say, if I had a sword, I would kill you right now. Wow. Talk about an overreaction. Do you know anyone in your life who overreacts slightly when they get angry? You don't have to point. Don't elbow your neighbor. This is, this is supposed to be a private, safe place. Why are you doing it? You don't, have, this is, don't rat out your spouse. This happens. This is, this, there is so much in here that we can identify with. So here's what happens. I love this. The donkey looks at his master, and he silences him with one simple question. He says, Master, look at how I have treated you. After all these years, you have ridden me. I have faithfully brought you everywhere you've wanted to go. I have served you. I have served under you, literally. Have I ever, ever done anything this bizarre? And Balaam doesn't know what to say. In fact, he answers one word, and it's so sheepish. You can just see him because he, he, he knows he's been beat. Have I ever done anything like this before? And Balaam's just like, no. You can just see his sandal just scuffing the, 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 the sand and the dirt just going... No, I guess not, because he's been beaten, and he's been humbled. And then, and only then, does God open Balaam's eyes. Don't miss that. That was the key to unlocking this, and that's where we pick the story up. Read with me right there, starting in verse 31 of Numbers 22. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And Balaam bowed his head, and he fell flat on his face. That's an appropriate response right there. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come to stand out against you, because your way is perverse before me. Now think about that. Some people say right here, the angel of the Lord is actually the Lord himself. One of the reasons they give is because notice that they capitalize me, and they say your way is perverse before me. I've come at you. I have found you offensive, okay? So that is one, one possible option here. Look at verse 33. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now. And I love this. Oh, and let her live. <laughs> I love the innocence here. And Balaam says to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. <laughs> For I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. See, in Balaam's story, God uses a strange and unexpected, very unlikely messenger to deliver a message, which makes me wonder, how often do we miss God's will because we aren't looking for it in unlikely places? How often are we open to hearing him speak? Or we only expect it one way. Here's the hidden gem. The angel that God sent was the technical roadblock. Don't miss this. The actual roadblock in Balaam's path was his pride and his arrogance. That's what caused him to miss this whole encounter. Think about that. It was his pride and arrogance. These were preventing him from hearing and obeying God's message. Think about this. Here's a supposedly wise, big-time prophet who is choosing now to suddenly believe that his longtime faithful friend and donkey is suddenly losing his mind and acting berserk rather than looking and trusting that maybe there's something going on, that the Lord is blocking his path for a reason. And I wonder, how many times do we do the very same thing? God, I want this door opened. Not that door. Not that door. That door. God, I know you created everything, and I know you have a wonderful plan for my life. But if you just take it from me this, this time, I know better. Now, we don't say that out loud, but the way we pray and the way we sometimes have a lack of faith, the way we don't wait on the Lord, the way we don't study his word, says, I got this. You just sit back, and I'll show you the way for my life, Lord. And then when I need you, I'll have you open the doors for me. Wow, what a lesson right there. Balaam's story shows us clearly when we keep plowing ahead on our own path and we keep ignoring God's message, it only leads to things getting worse for us. How stubborn are we? Are we really open to hearing his plan, his message? Think about this story that I just read this week of two unlikely war heroes. Happened back in World War II over 50 years ago. There was a pigeon named Tyke from Egypt. 
And there was a border collie from Great Britain named Peter. And these two animals were literally given the highest honor you could be given. It was called the Dickens Medals. These are the canine and feline equivalents of the Victoria Cross that you get in serving in the armed forces of Great Britain. So in World War II, they gave these two critters the highest honor. You know why? Because they were unlikely messengers. Peter, the dog, was responsible for saving the lives of six people who were buried under the rubble of a collapsed building. They were about to die, but Peter found them. And that goofy little pigeon named Tyke was the one who carried a vital message over 100 miles through gunfire and through the German blitz to go and take a message that rescued an entire crew of airmen. Why was this? Because God uses unlikely messengers in strange things. They weren't looking for this, but they were willing to hear the message, and it saved their lives. Before we give up on Balaam, and before we just write him off as just another hopeless cause, another, okay, that's a bad example in there, whatever, notice what he does, because there is a lesson here for us. Even though it takes Balaam three times to recognize God's presence with the help of a talking donkey, there is something incredible that happens. The minute he admits his fault and he humbles himself, beautiful things begin to happen. Don't miss this. It's three simple sentences. Very, very simple. Listen to how beautiful his simple confession is. The very first one, I have sinned. That's where it all starts. Confession and humility. I have sinned. Don't miss that. Then the second thing he says, I didn't realize you sent an angel to block my way. I didn't know. I I apologize for this. And then the last one, I'll turn around. In fact, I'll go home if you want me to. If that's what you want, you just say the word. I want to submit to you. I want to be in the middle of your will. Now, what is so beautiful about this? This shows us when we blow it, this is the proper response to finding God's will in your life. Notice what Balaam is a godless pagan prophet, and he does the right thing here. Think about this. That first statement represents his confession. I have sinned. That's the first step. That is not a positive, simple thing and it's popular to say in America anymore, is it? No, no, no. We brushed it under the carpet. I didn't sin. You sinned. (laughs) You made me do this, right? We find anyone else to be the scapegoat. But real, real humility shows I confess. The second thing reflects his humility. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. And then the third sentence right there reveals his submission to God's will. I will turn around if you want me to. I will go the opposite direction. You say the word. Will we do that? What a beautiful illustration of how to react when we miss God's will. So let's get personal. How do you react when God wants to redirect you? When you think you've got your plan figured out and you're heading down this road and God says, no, this door's closed for a reason. Do you keep kicking on the door? Most of us do. It's normal. Or are we open to hearing unique, unlikely messengers whispering to us going, hey, have you thought about this? Is there anyone in your life, anyone you look up to, a a brother, a a sister in Christ, who can speak truth into your life? Who could say, man, I heard about your decision, but have you prayed through that? Is there anybody in your life to be that talking donkey? Is there anyone that comes along and can say, hey, maybe it's time for some fresh obedience and humility to where you let God redirect your life? We've been talking a lot about repentance these last few weeks. I think that's something on God's heart, and he wants his church in America to know this. Maybe today we need to ask God to reveal anything in our life that is hindering us from hearing God's voice. Because sin can do that. Disobedience can do that. Prayerlessness can do that. Lack of studying his scriptures can do that. Charles Stanley has a beautiful quote. I love it. It says, we're either in the process of resisting God's truth or we're in the process of being shaped by it. Which one do you want? <laughs> I know which one I want. I don't want to resist it. I don't want to be rubbed up against a brick wall and have my ankle crushed and, and have a donkey have to talk to me. I want to be in the process of being shaped by his truth, his word. And that brings us to the next key point. We have got to know his word. We have got to study the scriptures. We have to be willing to apply them and read them. Without it, we simply flounder in our own wisdom. People come up and say, hey, Matt, what do you think? You know what? You don't want to know what I think. Let's find out what God thinks, because my wisdom is limited. Your wisdom is limited. We flounder in our own human secular reasoning apart from God. It's just us. And I read the Bible, and it talks about our hearts, and the heart is deceitful above all things. That's the only heart I trust. We have to know his scriptures. If you're looking for God's will, 
You need to know this, hear this, write this down. It is not the will of God if it goes against the word of God. It's not. We can justify it. We can have other denominations rewrite scripture to try to justify their sin. It is not God's will if it goes against his scripture. God does not come and give us his holy word and say, this is for all people well, except for you. <laughs> you can go do whatever you like. But over here, but everyone else, that is not God. He's not the author of confusion and chaos. If it's not his will, it goes against his word and it's clear. Write it down. He will never lead one of his followers to do anything that is contrary to his scriptures. So we got to know the scriptures. That's why Paul begs us in Colossians 3.16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Richly. Would you say that you have a grasp of the scriptures dwelling in you richly? Or maybe middle classly? Or poorly? What would you say? Because he says, let it dwell in you richly. The good news is this. As you read and study and meditate on the scriptures, you can find his will. Because often it is right there in black and white. Often. It is literally right there. The more you know his word, the more you know his will. And that is a beautiful thing. The more you know his word, the more you know his will. So those times that God speaks to you and it's vividly and it's powerfully and, it's, and that's great and it's awesome. You don't have to struggle to hear it. But what about, pastor, the times where... I don't hear his voice. What about those times where I think I'm seeking him and I just want to know and God just seems like he's a million miles away and I'm struggling here. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you today five key questions you can take with you now to begin to process through this entire time when God sees silent and you can't hear his voice. This is not some lofty theological knowledge that sounds great. This is not some ivory tower thing. These are practical things that you can do today. So if you're ready for some gold nuggets of truth, get your pens ready, write them down. The first question we got to ask ourselves, because we got to have an honesty check, am I really actively listening for God to speak to me right now? Am I actively listening? Notice what I wrote here. It didn't say, am I casually listening for God to speak? It didn't say, I threw up a prayer on my way to work in the car. I had 37 seconds. It was an awesome time with the Lord. And I threw up a prayer and said, God, I really need to know. And then I went about my way. That's not actively seeking. That's casually seeking. Am I genuinely active? Only you can answer this. Be honest with yourself because this is only to benefit you. Are you actively looking, waiting, expecting, and seeking him to speak to you? We know God speaks through his spirit. We know God speaks through his word. We know God can speak through a message, but have you considered unlikely sources? What about a song? That third song we sang today was perfect. That was exactly what we're talking about today. God spoke to me through that. Maybe a Christian friend, maybe a brother, maybe a sister, maybe an a, a inspirational film, or maybe a random Facebook post that contains some scriptural truth that you realize that's not random. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, I needed that. I can't tell you how many times I posted a scripture that says, that was for me today. And I'm like, actually, it was for me. But you know what? It was for both of us. It wasn't random at all. God can use those things. The question is, are we open to him speaking through any method he chooses? Or do you put him in the box? Are we really listening? Are you making a conscious effort to hear him speak? Which brings us to the next one. When you find yourself at a crossroads and you're needing to make a decision and you're at that moment, you need to ask yourself this next question. Do you sense, is there a holy tug, a nudge, a God-given desire at all that is pulling you one way or the other? Do you sense a holy tug, that Holy Spirit? I shared with you that time that I was a freshman in college, and I was going into a movie theater, and I sat down with a couple other guys, and within minutes, that movie was totally different than what we were expecting. And I felt immediately a nudge inside me that said, get me out of here. That was the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to me if I'm going to obey that. I don't need to see this. Get me out of here. That's that holy nudge, that, that holy tug. Think about this. Do I have a passion for what I am considering here? This endeavor, whatever it is that you are at that crossroads, God will not guide you to a certain endeavor without first placing a desire in your heart to do that very thing. Before Bill Hagedis took people to Ghana, there was a desire, a holy desire that God put in his heart. He didn't do that in his flesh. On his own power, I would never work, right? you got to have the Spirit leading and open those doors. Do you have that holy desire? It comes from God. 
Here is a scripture that you need to take with you that we butcher. We twist this, we misinterpret it, and it says this. It's Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Who gives the desires? He will. We butcher this. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say he will give you everything you've ever wanted or everything you've ever lusted after or everything you fantasized about or everything you think you need to be whole. We take this verse and we turn this into some cosmic Christmas list. God, I'm happy in you, and I'm going to expect you to give me the desire. That is not what this is saying. This is not about what our flesh wants. For the person that is already abiding in the Spirit, who is delighting themselves, the desires of the heart are implanted by God. He gives the desires. If there are godly desires in your heart to do something for his kingdom, you can rest assured they are from him. Because our heart does not naturally beat for him. That's why we die daily. He gives us the good desires. He gives us the godly desires in our hearts. Don't miss that. Look for that holy tug and that God-given desire. The next question to ask ourselves, has God provided a divine opportunity here? Is there a divine opportunity? Is there something? Just because we have a desire or a holy tug does not necessarily mean it's God's will for that very moment. Here's the key. Oh, this is so good. If it is God's will, the desire will be accompanied by an opportunity. Don't miss this. Look to see if there is a way to implement or exercise that divine giftedness, that holy tug, that passion that he's given you to serve him or serve others. Let me say it again. Look to see if there is a way to implement or exercise your giftedness, your passion, that holy tug that God has given you to serve him or serve others. Notice what I didn't say, to serve yourself. Because God is not selfish. He is selfless, and he showed us that ultimate example. Is there a way to implement the giftedness and the passion God's given you to advance his kingdom or to serve others? That's why it's on our walls the first thing you come in. Love God, love people. Serve God, serve people. Which brings us to the next question. Fourthly, ask yourself, do I have peace or turmoil when I pray about this? If you can't hear from God, when you are thinking about an opportunity or an endeavor or you're facing a big decision, does your spirit sense a peacefulness and a confirmation when you pray about this, or is it unsettled? Because if you have an unsettled spirit and there's something nagging you in your heart or something in the back of your mind, consider this. Maybe something's not quite right on purpose. Maybe the opportunity could be fine, the opportunity's right, but maybe the timing is just off a little bit. Perhaps every light is lined up green except the last one. And you are waiting for that last final green light. And you are waiting for a very good reason. Which brings us to the final question. Has the door remained open? Or has God shut it? Is it closed for a reason? Ask yourself that. Here's the rub. As followers of Christ, if we're serious about our faith, our mission is to be obedient and faithful and to keep walking daily in faith no matter what God has asked us to do, daily trusting that if the path remains clear and the door remains open and all the lights are green and you have peace when you pray and you feel his confirmation, then it is probably time for you to step out in faith and proceed. If all those lights are green, however, if you pray and you get to this final question of these five questions and you still sense that that door seems closed to your option, to your endeavor, to your destination, if it appears blocked, perhaps by an unseen angel or a talking donkey, then maybe prayerfully consider that perhaps this is not God's will for you for the moment. And pause. Perhaps he has shut the door for a reason, a great reason that you just don't see yet. Here's the deal. If God shuts a door, stop banging on this. It is not meant for you at this time, in this moment. Don't ram into the door repeatedly and break your shoulder when God is saying, please, I have something. This is exactly what happened to Paul, the great, awesome Apostle Paul, when he so badly wanted to go to Asia in Bithynia. He wanted to go, he wanted to go, and he wanted to go, and every occasion God kept shutting the door. And Acts 16, 7 says this, the Spirit just did not permit me. I couldn't go. I want to go, but every time the door was shut. Here's the deal. This wasn't a rebuke to Paul. This wasn't a punishment to Paul. Paul was being obedient to what God was about to ask him to do. He wasn't, a, he wasn't sinning. Paul wanted to go here, but it wasn't God's will. In fact, when God finally got through to Paul and he heard him, Paul heard God say, you need to go to Macedonia. 
And Paul did. And guess what happened? A huge revival broke out in Philippi. It was awesome. Notice what he says. He says, after I had seen the vision, immediately we turned. We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us there. You know what the Greek word concluding actually means there? It means everything came together. Green lights up and down the stoplight. He had the green lights. And guess what? He sought his will, he found his will, and he went, and he was in the perfect center of God's will. He didn't keep knocking on that door with his shoulder, banging on this door to go to Bithynia. God said, Macedonia, and he said, roger that, and he went, and we have revival. It's incredible, but he had to seek God's will. Beautiful, beautiful illustration. Some of you may remember, I shared a story, it's one of my favorite illustrations, of a freighter that sank. The freighter was named the al Kuwait. And it was in the Persian Gulf. And it had made it its entire destination. And as this freighter arrives in the Persian Gulf up to the city, something horrible happened, and it sank. And it sank within eyesight of its dock. But it was deep enough that it sank and was completely submerged. The only problem was it wasn't just a normal freighter. This freighter was loaded with 6,000 living sheep. And when it sank, they all died. Well, now they had a problem. Not only was the freighter in the way, and it was horrible, it was about to become an ecological disaster that they could not handle. You know why? Because that was where they got their drinking water from. The desalination plants were right there, and these sheep were beginning to fester and rot, and the clock was ticking, and they knew they had to get this thing up. But then they said, oh, we have a problem. We've never lifted anything this big. What do we do? Because if that hole ruptures, Those toxins are going to seep out, and it will ruin the drinking water of thousands upon thousands of people who will die if they cannot have fresh water. Now what do we do? So they summoned every great scientist, every great engineer in 1964 that they could round up, and they all flew in, and they sat around their big tables, and they had their little pocket protectors and slide rules, and they were going to town, and none of them could come up with a viable way to rescue this. Finally, after all ideas were exhausted, a Danish scientist, an engineer named Carl Croyer, raised his hand, very sheepishly, no pun intended, and he said, I have, a, I have an idea. It's a little outside the box. And they said, speak. He said, what if we take millions of small styrofoam balls and we pump them down under the water into the hull? See, the idea was this. Styrofoam was light. And if they could pump enough down into here, it should, in theory, displace the water. And the boat, in theory, should eventually take on neutral buoyancy and then positive buoyancy and slowly float to the top. They didn't have any other ideas, and they said, let's try it. Those sheep are rotting by the day. So they filled it, and they started pumping them in, millions of styrofoam balls, and slowly it started to lift. Then it achieved neutral buoyancy, and then it broke the surface of the water, and it floated. And with bated breath, they moved that out of the harbor, and the hull never broke. The media went berserk. Carl Croyer was hailed as this amazing scientist. said, you have got to tell us where you got your inspiration. Was it your lofty education? Was it all your engineer friends? Did you get around in the after hours and scratch your heads and think, well, what if we tried this and that? Was it some divine inspiration? And he said, my inspiration came from the great theologian known as Donald Duck. True story. 15 years earlier, he had seen a comic strip where they were trying to raise a sunken yacht by putting ping pong balls into the hull of a yacht. And Carl Croyer said, I figured if it worked in a cartoon, maybe it'll work in real life. And it did. Here's the lesson for us. This did not come from a likely messenger. It came from an unlikely messenger, from a very strange way. But if he wasn't willing to entertain this, he would have missed his greatest achievement. Are you seeing this? He would have missed being the hero of the moment and rescuing thousands of people from having poison drinking water. But he was willing to do this and have an idea that was so outside the box, which makes me wonder, do we miss God's greatest achievement? in our lives because we're not willing to step up and to say, God, are you speaking to an unlikely messenger today? This, this, this might be for me. Balaam learned the hard way that when the path is blocked or temporarily shut down, it could be for a good reason. Don't be upset with that. Thank God for it. He's stopping you from, if you're at an impasse today, and some of you are, if you're at a crossroads today and you are not sure and God seems silent, 
Perhaps he is about to speak to you using an unlikely messenger coming your way today. Maybe it's this week. Are you open to hearing it? Are you willing to listen? That's your challenge this week. Be on the lookout for him to speak to you through an unlikely way, through unlikely messengers. For somebody, maybe a Christian brother that you haven't spoken with, somebody who hadn't talked to you in 20 years but maybe pings you on social media, what is the way? Because God is not trying to veil his will. He's not trying to hide it. He's not playing some goofy cosmic game of hide and seek with us. Thankfully, God's not fickle like that. He wants you to discover his will even more than you want to know it. So let's pray about it. Bow with me. God, I thank you that you don't leave us just lost and wandering. I thank you that you have given us your word and you have given us your spirit. And you could speak through anything, just like you did with Balaam and the talking donkey. Lord, our prayer is that you would not let us miss it. God, help us to be still long enough to sense you speaking. Help us to search. Help us to knock. And help us not to push through walls that you have put up in our way. God, we want to be sensitive. And just like Balaam, Lord, we want to submit to you. We want to have humility. We want to confess our sins so that you can reveal and you can let the scales fall from our eyes. We know that you don't want to hide your will from us, Lord, so we seek. The song we just sang was seek first. God, we want to seek your kingdom and your righteousness and everything else will be added to us. Thank you for the privilege that we can pray with you, to listen with you, to have you speak with us. You're an awesome God and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.